Today's sermon I have entitled The Cost of Giving Up. And that's what we're going to look at in just a few moments. But we're going to read Luke chapter 10 beginning with verse 57 as our text for today. And let me invite you. What? I'm sorry, Luke 9. Just turn back one. You can, you can get to it from there. Luke 10 right after that, if you didn't notice. Let's stand in honor of reading from God's Word today. Luke chapter 9 and verse 57. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you. But let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Lord, bless the reading of your scripture. May your Holy Spirit speak to each one of us today in a special and a personal way that you may tell each one of us today what you have for us in our lives from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to share today the cost of giving up. It's very easy to get started in things. Every time I turn around, somebody is wanting to get married. I have young couples calling me all the time and saying, we want to get married. Can you counsel with us? The other morning, before we ever got dressed and away from the house, I had a knock on the door. And this young man was standing there and he said, my fiance and I want to get married today. Can you counsel us? Because we went to the courthouse and they won't give us a marriage license unless we wait three days or get a counseling. And I said, well, there's no way in the world that we can do the counseling today and get you the paperwork and everything that you need. He said, but we had planned to go on our honeymoon this afternoon. He was excited. And they had been all over town looking for somebody that could counsel them and get them a marriage license so they could go on their honeymoon this afternoon. Everybody's excited about getting married. I've never met a young couple that came into my office and said, yeah, we're going to get married. She's making me. I don't want to, but he's all I got. You know, they came in excited. Boy, they come in holding hands. They're looking at each other with their big eyes. And and every time I try to ask one of them a question, they don't hear me because they're looking into each other's eyes. And, And I begin to try to warn them about some things. I share with them, look at this and look at that and make sure of some things. I have a questionnaire and I ask them on this questionnaire. She takes one, he takes the other with the same questions and they fill them out without each other and they come back and they never have the same answers to the questions. Who's going to be in charge of this? Each one of them thinks they are. Who's going to do this or do that? And the other one, they have the same answer there. I'm going to do it. No, I'm going to do it. Well, you never said you want. How many children do you want? Zero, four. They never have the same answers. And I try to warn them, these are some warning signs. These are some red flags that go up. And they go, but we're in love. And everything falls second place to being in love. And it's so easy to sit there when you're engaged and to say, nothing else matters. I don't care if he throws his clothes on the floor. I love that man. That'll change. Why do you throw your clothes on the floor? I've always thrown my clothes. That's going to change, she says. She tolerates everything I do. She loves me. That'll change. He never says anything about the money I spend or the places I... That'll change. It's easy to sit there when you're anticipating getting married and moving in together. You're getting out from under mom and dad and all those rules and all those restrictions... You haven't seen rules and restrictions until you get married. It'll change. But they sit there 
just as we all did with these big plans and big ideas and just let me do it. Just let that date get here. Let me get married. We got a wedding this afternoon at 3 o'clock. I last talked with them last night at rehearsal. It doesn't matter what's going on in their life right now. They're going to get married tomorrow. I tried to tell her. She's marrying a Marine. I tried to tell her. But, well, anyway, she's going to get married anyway. But then you see them a little bit later. You go into a restaurant, and there's this young lady with another young man. It didn't work out. Oh, it, it just didn't work out. I, I didn't realize he was like this. Or you meet this young man with the, I didn't know she was like that when we got married. And oh, sometimes it's just a minor thing. But oh, it's easy to walk away. It's easy to say, well, it's not what I thought it was. I thought it was going to be just wonderful. I thought if I got out of mom and dad's house and got out on my own and had my own wife, my own family, everything would be beautiful and all things change. And then we say, I want out. Well, I say that as an introduction to this. It's not much difference in the lives of many people when they come to know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. People say, oh, I've had problems. I've been walking in the valley. I've been walking in the desert. But I've come now and I've found a church and, and I've found Christ and, and I'm so excited and I want to serve him and do this and do that. Give me some things to do. Give me a class to go to. I have found my family and my friends here and everything's going to be wonderful. But my friends, Christ said right here in this verse that there are some things you're going to have to go through if you want to be one of his disciples. What are the causes oftentimes of people turning away from Christ. Here's some reasons that people often give up. You see, we know they're going to give up because in John 6, 66, it says there that Jesus was with his disciples and some of them went back and walked no more with him. And Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 10, that Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Time after time, we see disciples and apostles and friends of Christ and of his disciples and apostles who when the going got tough, turned and walked away. Sometimes I pick up the newspaper and I look in there at all of the public record and I hesitate to tell Jean this because she may get mad at me, but we found out that one of the four guys that robbed Jean lives right there on our street on our block. Yeah. Yeah. I find a lot of stuff in that public record. I might find some of you there sometime. But there's all the people who got arrested. And, and then they go down to the marriage license that were issued. And there's usually a few of them. And then they go down to divorces granted. And there's usually quite a few. Because when the going gets tough, we say, I want out. When the going gets tough in our serving Jesus Christ, sometimes people just turn and say, oh, I want out. Here's some reasons that people give. They say the way is too hard. It's just too hard to be a Christian. It's too hard to serve the Lord the way He wants me to. It's too demanding. Well, that's not true because Jesus said in His Word in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 that His yoke is easy and His burden is light. You know, the reason it seems so tough is because we try to do it ourselves. He said His burden is light. If we'll just let him carry it, oh, how light it can be. But if I try to carry it myself, then it's going to be difficult for me. In Philippians 4, 19, Paul said, My God shall supply all of your needs. And in Hebrews 4, 16, it says, We may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Christ provides all of these things for us. I've got a plaque on my wall at home. That's just a little bit different than the normal saying. You know, there's a saying that says, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. I got a plaque at home that says, when the going gets tough, the tough eat chocolate. <laughs> but I want to tell you today that when it comes to serving Christ, when the going gets tough, the tough should get going. We need to be serving our Lord even when the hard times come, even when the difficulties come. So many disciples said, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you want me to go. 
And then when they came to that first hill, to that first mountain, to that first challenge, we turn and we walk away. Some say because the way is too hard. Others say because there's persecution in my life. I didn't know people were going to treat me like this. I didn't know my friends were going to abandon me. I didn't know my family was going to be angry and abandon me. 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul said, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Somebody is going to dislike you because you've become different. You have become set apart. You have become a different person than you were. They liked you better when your language was like theirs. They liked you better when you drank like they did. They liked you better when you acted like them and did the things they did because they're still living in the world and you're no longer in the world. And yes, there's going to be persecution. But Jesus said this, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. You know, there's something about being in good company. I've had people say, well, you know, this may be happening or that may be happening, but I'm in good company because it's happening to a lot of people. And Jesus said, that's the way they treated me. How can you expect any different? They persecuted me when I walked on this earth. So you can expect those persecutions. And Paul, uh, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 11, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you. My friends, if you're not being persecuted today because of your belief, probably nobody knows what your beliefs are. If you're not being looked at strangely by some folks today, probably they don't know because you've hidden well your beliefs in Him. That's so sad when we have folks that on Sunday come and are so bold in their Christianity. We sit in the pew, we sing, we clap, we rejoice, we go back out, we look left and right to make sure none of our friends are looking. We get in our cars and drive away and that's it for the week. They have no idea who we are or what we believe in because we don't want to be persecuted. John warned in 1 John 3, 13, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Because if they don't, something's wrong. Because my friends, you and I, if we know Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we are an enemy to this world. Jesus was an enemy to Satan. Satan tried to tempt him. Satan tried to trick him. Satan tried to trick Adam and Eve in the garden. The very first people that God made, Satan set out to tempt them and to trick them and to change them over. And he's still doing that today. We are against this world if we're born again believers in Jesus Christ and it's going to cause persecution. Some say it's too hard. Some say I don't want to be persecuted. Others say I lost all of my friends. I lost all of my family. And I'm not willing to do that. My friends were very important to me. My friend, I want you to know, Proverbs 17, 17 says, A true friend loveth at all times. If you've got a true friend out there, they're going to love you whether you're a Christian or not. They're not going to want you to stay like you always were just so they can be your friend. Your family, if they are truly your friend, are going to continue to love you. And don't worry about it because you're going to gain greater friends than you ever lost by becoming a child of the King. And remember this, the best friend of all is Jesus Christ himself. You can't find another friend anywhere in this world that's like Jesus. Proverbs 18, 24 said, There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That friend is Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All my sins and griefs to bear. What a friend I have in Jesus. I can take everything to him. In prayer, He never leaves me. He never forsakes me. Do I have to worry about my worldly friends? No. Because I'll always have a friend in Jesus. Some say their relatives are against me. Matthew 10, 37 says, He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. My friends, I'm going to tell you, I love my mother. My mother's been in the hospital. I talked to her last night. She just got out of the hospital. and She's not real happy right now because my sisters wouldn't let her go home. She's 84 years old. She cares for my 50-year-old sister. 
And she wanted to go home and get back to doing what she was doing. She's so weak she can't hardly walk, but she wanted to be in charge. And my oldest sister made her go home with her. And so my mother wasn't real happy last night when I talked to her. But I want you to understand this. Christ said that I must put him first and my little 84-year-old mother second. In my time of thinking, in what I do and what I say, Christ must be first. And I don't want you to misunderstand. He doesn't want me to stop loving my mother. He doesn't want me to stop caring for my mother. But he says that if you'll put me first, I'll take care of your mother. Because you see, my mother's strength is in the Lord. It's not in her son. If it was in her son, she'd have given up a long time ago. She'd have given up when I was in high school if her strength had been in me. But her strength coming from the Lord because that's where her outlook in life is. So I've got to put him first. And that's what we must do. We must put Christ first. And our family will understand. Yes, sometimes we might think that we've lost it all. But we've lost nothing when we've gained Christ. Those are some of the causes, just a few of the causes. But what is the cost of giving up? First of all, you'll lose your influence. You know, we tell our friends, I'm a Christian now. Well, last Sunday, I became a Christian. Last Sunday, I, I accepted Christ and I was baptized. And oftentimes, we tell our friends that. And then they look and they watch us. Because you said you have had a change in your life. You said that a life that was once controlled by Satan is now controlled by Jesus Christ. Once you were lost, but now you're found. And they're looking for a difference in your life. They're looking for you to be different. And my friends, if you and I show a weak change, if you and I go back in a couple of days to being just like we were, then we're not going to make a difference in anyone's life. In Acts 4.13, it says that they know we are Christians because we have been with Jesus. My friends, if you've had a confrontation with Jesus face to face and he has changed your life, then you can't ever go back. And if you do, your friends are going to look at you and say, what a hypocrite. I knew it wasn't going to last. You know, there's some folks that got married and everything was against them. My mother was one, just a young girl. I talked to some of you, and you got married when you were 13, 14, 15 years old. Everybody said it wouldn't last, and when you had your 50th wedding anniversary, they were still waiting for it to end because they just knew it wasn't going to last. But my friends, a lot of times, we can fight all odds and make it work. If we've met Jesus face to face, it doesn't matter what the world thinks. We can make that work. We're told that we are the light of the world and we're to let our light so shine before men that they see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. My friend, if we walk in and tell them that we've got that new light and we've got that new light shining in our life and then the next time they see us, it's out, then we're never going to have an influence on those people and we won't have an influence for Christ. A lot of people have lost their savor. You know, the Bible tells us that we're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, it is good for nothing. So the cost of giving up and walking away is you lose your influence. Not only that, but the scripture tells us that we lose our good conscience. You remember what it's like for your conscience to be bothering you so bad? When you know you've done something, that was the problem when I was growing up. I had been raised in a Christian home. I had already given my life to Christ. And then I hit my teenage years and I tried my best to be like those other kids. I didn't want to lose my friends. I didn't want to be persecuted. So I set out to try to be like the others. And they were having a good time and my conscience was ripping my chest out. Because I knew what I was doing was wrong. And I was one miserable creature. I tried to put on a smile, but around every corner, 
I just knew mother was standing. Every time I did something, I knew mother was going to catch me. I went off one time with these guys I weren't supposed to be with, and they did something that they weren't supposed to do. I didn't even do it. I promise. I didn't even do it. I just stood there and watched them do it. And then they ran, and I ran. Because I was standing there with them. I was one of those accessories before and after the fact and during the fact. And they ran and I ran and we got separated running out through the different places and I ran all the way home. And I got home and mom and dad wasn't there. And I ran in that house and I shut that door and I turned off all the lights and for the next hour and a half, every car that came down the street, I just knew it was the cops and they were going to take me away. I want you to understand I was a miserable creature because I didn't have a good conscience. Well, I have a good conscience today. And when a cop comes down the street, I don't worry about whether he's coming after me because I have a good conscience. I try to do everything I can according to the law. And when I see police, it doesn't bother me because I have a good conscience. I don't have to worry about whether he's looking for me or not, but most of all, I can stand before God with a good conscience because I'm trying to serve Him. In Acts 23, 1, it says, I have lived in good conscience before God. Hebrews 13, 18 says, It is wonderful to have a good conscience. And Paul said in Acts 24, 16, A conscience void of offense towards God and towards men was what he had. My friends, if you turn from God, and if you go back to the way you were living, I promise you, your conscience is going to bother you. And you're going to lose your joy. I don't know about you, but the joy of serving Christ is more important to me than anything else. I love the time that we have praise and worship. And when we're not having praise and worship, when we're not having our time of worship, every chance I get, I'm worshiping Him anyway. And I worship Him the best through music. That's just the way I worship Him. Through music and through nature and through things like that. When we ride a lot of times going to different places, my wife will point out a beautiful bush or a beautiful sunset or a beautiful sky. Or we have music going in the car. I have the car music on. I have music in my office. I have music everywhere I go. I got music in the bedroom. When I wake up in the morning, Becky says, it's time to get up. And I reach over and get the remote and the music starts. That's the first thing I hear in the morning is the music because that's how I can just worship Him and feel close to Him. And I wake up to it and try to go to bed to it. But there's a lot of joy in serving the Lord. Nehemiah 8.10 says, The joy of the Lord is your strength. That's where we draw strength from is in the joy of the Lord. Psalm 144.15 says, Happy is the people whose God is the Lord. Can you lose that joy? Oh, yes. Go read David and his writings in Psalm. David said in Psalm 51, 12, Lord, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Why? Because he had lost it. Why? Because he had gotten out of fellowship with the Lord and his conscience was tearing him up. If you quit before you ever receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you stand to lose your very soul. Some people come to the church and for a while they're excited and they're thinking about making Christ their personal Lord and Savior. They're thinking about getting involved and thinking about doing these things and then the world draws them back out and they leave without Christ in their life and they stand to lose their very soul. But Mark eight thirty six says, What will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose? his own soul. You may be the most popular person in the county. You may be highly recognized. You may be rich. You may live in the biggest house, drive the finest automobile. Everywhere you go, people may bow before you and give you the finest table in the restaurant. But my friend, if you lose your soul, what have you gained? Just a little temporary fame that one day is going to go away. Would it be nice to be recognized as someone? I suppose it would. 
Would it be nice to be given great things? I suppose it would. But I want to tell you something. There is nothing greater than the day when we stand before Jesus Christ at the great white throne judgment and he says, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into thy kingdom forevermore. What a joy that's going to be. But all oh, those that have the fine car and the fine house and the great reputation and all the recognition in the world that have turned their backs on Jesus Christ and never received him, that hear these words from Jesus Christ when he says, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Oh, my friends, just a few years of worldly recognition that could cost you eternity with him. Well, look at the eternal woes that are awaiting every lost soul. Matthew 9, 44 talks about a fire that will not be quenched. Matthew 18, 8 talks about everlasting fire. 2 Thessalonians 1, 9 talks about everlasting destruction. Matthew 25, 46 talks about everlasting punishment. Is it indeed worth it for a little recognition, for a little glory, for a little wealth on this earth? Is it worth? an eternity of punishment and everlasting fire? Or would you rather on this earth just have the joy of salvation, a clear conscience, Jesus Christ as your best friend, and knowing that there's a mansion being built for you this day in glory to where you're going to dwell for eternity with him? Woodrow Wilson said, I had rather lose in a cause that will someday win than win in a cause that will someday lose. These are your choices today. Why give up? Revelation 2.10 says there's a reward ahead for us. And Romans 8.31 says, If God be for us, who can be against us? Those are our choices today. If you've never accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you need to come and do that today so you can begin to experience that joy. Have that clear conscience. Know that when you leave this earth that you're going to spend eternity with Him. If you're backslidden today, won't you come back into the fold, come back into a right relationship with Him and get your life straight again so you can begin to enjoy being a child of the King. So your light will shine again. So your salt will have savor again. If you're out of relationship, get right with Him today. Maybe you need to publicly profess Him. Maybe you need to be baptized. You've never done that. Maybe you need church membership. Maybe you just need to get involved in working for Him. You've been a sidelined person all this time. You need to step up and say, Here am I, Lord. Use me. I'm proud to be one of your children. Use me where you'd have me to be. But my friends, most miserable are those that turn their back on Christ. There's a lot of causes why people give up but my friend there's a greater cost when people do give up our hymn of invitation today is now I belong to Jesus do you really belong to him today if you don't you want to if you don't belong to him today you need to you come and make him your personal Lord and Savior if you belong to him are you in a right relationship with him or have you turned your back on him and let your light go out let your salt lose its savor. Turn back to the things of the world. Then today you can turn around and get back in a right relationship with him. One of the greatest examples we'll ever see is old Peter. Who said, Lord, I'd die for you. Lord, there is nothing that I wouldn't do for you. I'll pull my sword right now and cut off that soldier's ear. I'll prove to you that there is nothing I won't do for you. And the Lord said, put your sword up. Before the rooster crows three times, you will have turned your back on me and denied me. Or before the rooster crows, you will have turned your back and denied me three times. Peter said, no, sir, Lord, not me. This is Peter you're talking to. This isn't John. This isn't those other weak disciples. This is Peter, the rock. And then they hung him on the cross. And old Peter got scared. And he went over and mingled among the crowd. And one of the young ladies says, I know you. You're a disciple of his. 
And Peter said, not me. She says, oh, yes, I've seen you with him. You're his disciple. Peter said, young lady, I said, not me. And again, she said, oh, yeah, I saw you with him. I know it's you. And the scripture says he cursed and said, young lady, you are mistaken. And then the rooster crowed. And Peter hung his head and he wept. There in front of that crowd, he had lost his light. There in front of that crowd, he had lost his savor. He had had a chance to stand up for the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he had denied him. But it doesn't stop there. Just a little bit later, we find old Peter with his light shining bright, with his salt as strong or stronger than ever, standing before the multitudes at Pentecost where thousands were saved because he got back in a right relationship with Christ. And Peter said, now I belong to Jesus. Now I belong to him. Not for just a few years, but for time and eternal. And Peter died for him, my friends, after he got in a right relationship with him. What's your relationship today? I encourage you to get in a right relationship with him today. And you can't be that way if you don't know him. You can't be that way if you're not walking with him. If you're not in the church you need to be in, in the service you need to be in, in a right relationship with him, you can't be what he wants you to be. We're going to stand now. We're going to have our prayer. Stand with me. And as we begin to sing, Now I belong to Jesus, won't you do what he's calling you to do? As your Holy Spirit draws you today, won't you do what he wants you to do. Lord, we give this totally and completely into your hands. May thy will be done. Lord, if there are any here today that have never publicly professed you, may they do so. If there be any here today that's never invited you to come into their heart, may today be the day of salvation. Lord, if there are those who have drawn away from you because of fear, because of family, because of friends, Lord, may you draw them back today into the joy of salvation with you. May their light be brighter. May their salt be stronger. May they be whatever you want them to be. May they belong to you today fully and completely. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.